Hey, kids cook real food. Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector. And today we're talking about, whoo, so tired. No, just kidding. Today we're talking about fatigue and, and how we can figure out if we're feeling fatigue or just kind of tired because we're parents and we have kids and they're tiring. And, you know, a few other topics as well. I'm honored to host Dr. Evan Hirsch, who is an internationally renowned expert on fatigue. Thank you so much for putting up with me today, Evan. <laughs> Katie, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, well, this is going to be really, really interesting. Parents, I heard Evan speak a few months ago, and he spoke about not only fatigue, but also how his work with, with fatigue has transferred to helping people struggling with long haulers. And I was immediately intrigued. Um, I know I have a couple of friends from high school who are struggling with that. And it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So I wanted to have Dr. Hirsch on the show and I'm really excited. So let me do the official bio so that people know kind of from where you're coming. And then we're going to jump right in. Evan Hirsch is an MD and a world-renowned fatigue and long haulers expert. He's the founder and CEO of the International Center for Fatigue. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and online programs, he's helped thousands of people around the world resolve their chronic fatigue, that's a thing, and long haulers symptoms, also a thing, naturally, which I love. He's on a mission to help a million more. Some of you may be listening right now. He's been featured on TV podcasts and summits, and when he's not at the office, you can find him singing musicals, dancing hip hop, and playing basketball with his family. I have three boys who dance hip hop, so I thought that was pretty sweet. Do you do the break dancing or just stay standing up on your feet? Uh, yeah, I'm usually, you know, I'm, I don't have the cardboard anymore where I'm like spinning around on the ground, but yeah, I'm up on my feet. <laughs> nice. My, my oldest, Paul, is a junior, and he just went to prom this weekend and the other parents were like, who's going to beat Paul in the dance competition? And they're all like, nobody, but I understand he didn't actually get to break dance, but he did at homecoming, which is pretty fun. Nice. So, so what's your story? How did you end up like figuring out how to help people struggling with long haulers based on this expertise you have in fatigue? Why, why are you interested in tired people? <laughs> that is the question. So it really all started um, when I was in high school. My older sister actually came back from college, was working a job in Manhattan. We were living in New Jersey at the time. And she ended up with chronic fatigue. And I really didn't know what was going on with her. I was kind of doing my own thing and she was doing her own thing. But she was basically in her room all the time. And mom was taking her to whoever she could, nutritionist, even an iridologist or whatever. And she slowly worked her way out of it. But that was kind of just on the periphery. But then when I started my residency in family medicine, I met my wife, we fell in love. And three months later, she couldn't get out of bed. And her fatigue lasted for three years. And then she was about 80% better at that time. And I was supposed to be at the pinnacle of my education. And I'm asking every doctor that I can about fatigue and how to help her. And besides thyroid and cancer and a couple of other illnesses, there really wasn't much that conventional medicine could offer. So here I am incredibly feeling incredibly powerless with this woman that I love. And it was definitely very, you know, I'm working 80 hours and I'm trying to help her, you know, do this. She was already running a business at this time, very stressful for both of us. And so that was kind of like my first taste. And so, but it still didn't sink in yet that this was something that I had to focus on. So then I graduated residency, we got married, we had a kid. I started my own practice right out of uh, residency in functional medicine, holistic functional medicine. I did my first functional medicine training, started helping people with integrative and functional medicine. And then three years later, I started getting tired. And my fatigue lasted for five years and it just about destroyed every aspect of my life. I had a, a business where I was bringing in $1.2 million a year, but I was so burnt out and I had so much fatigue and brain fog and body pain that I had to keep hiring people to do my job. Um, and then when I would come home, we've got this new baby and my wife is getting over her fatigue and she's like, hey, can you help out with the dishes? And all I could do was lie on the couch. Oh, so I felt so much shame, so much guilt. And after napping for the 999th day in a row underneath my desk during lunch, oh my God. looking up at the top of the, at the bottom of the desk and thinking, I can't let this go on. 
And that was my breaking point. And then I realized, you know what? I'm practicing functional medicine. I should be able to apply this to myself. And so I, I started doing that. And I realized if I could find all of the causes that I was going to be successful. And I went through this process of reading everything that I could, attending all the conferences that I could, and anything that had an inkling to be related to energy. I started applying to the people in my clinic, and I found that there were 33 different causes of fatigue and low energy, and that everybody who has low energy has 20 plus causes, which is why it's so challenging to treat. So I wrote a book about it. And as you mentioned, I got online programs and I'm on a mission to help as many people as possible. That's incredible. As soon as you said 33 causes, like my brain already went to, Ooh, I wonder, does everyone have all 33? So again, that's why it's so, it's a complicated web because it could be any 20 or 22 or 25, but you're saying people with chronic fatigue have a lot of things going on. Exactly. And in conventional medicine, we look at something, it's called Occam's razor, where basically one diagnosis explains everything. Well, it actually doesn't work that way in fatigue and for a lot of chronic problems, which is why conventional medicine is helpful for, you know, you break your leg, you go to the emergency room, that's where it really helps. But if you want to reverse a chronic disease, then you really have to kind of go down and start looking at like, what are the imbalances that somebody has and how do we fix them? Well, it takes such a paradigm shift and we can see that in the words you just used, reverse a chronic disease, where chronic should mean forever, mm-hmm. right? The fact that we can even use the phrase reverse a chronic disease is a beautiful, hopeful, optimistic thing. But um, what, what are some of those causes that, that play into chronic fatigue? Maybe the more popular ones. Sure. Well, and I'll, yeah, maybe the more popular ones. It can get, the list is kind of exhausting, but I'm happy to get into all of it. But we kind of divide things up into deficiencies and toxicities, where deficiencies are things that are not in the body that are supposed to be in the body. And so these are things like hormones, vitamins, minerals, neurotransmitters, which are like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and then lifestyle habits. So not enough food, good food, not enough good water, not enough movement, not enough sleep. So those are like the things that you don't have enough of. And then there's the things, oh, and then mindset, not enough good mindset. And then there's things that you have too much of. And these are things like heavy metals and chemicals and molds and infections and allergies and negative emotional patterns and electromagnetic fields. So basically things that you have accumulated over your lifetime that have built up and now are, have spilt over and are now causing symptoms. Your body can't tolerate them anymore. Now, the interesting thing too is that these toxicities, they're actually responsible for 80% of these deficiencies. So even though you ha- you know, everybody has 20 plus causes when they're tired, it's really mainly caused by these toxins over time that end up causing a number of these deficiencies. So you really have to dig in and figure out what is showing up in the body. Now I've been making some jokes. I've been a little unfair about fatigue. Fatigue is not the same as being tired or yawning. I get that, but like, but do help us out here because a lot of parents say and joke about like, I'm just bone tired, right? I'm exhausted. What is the difference between being tired at the end of the day, because you have a busy life and kids and actual chronic fatigue? How do we know? So there it's a gamut, you know? So if you have tiredness, that's not relieved by rest, that's a problem. And whether that's fatigue or whether that's chronic fatigue syndrome, where you have to have a certain criteria in order for a a doctor to proclaim you to have this illness, which they don't have treatment for, unfortunately, so it doesn't really help if you actually get that label, it runs the gamut. So if you are getting seven to nine hours of sleep at night and you're still tired during the day or you're surviving on caffeine during the day or your energy is crashing at three o'clock every day, then there's a problem. And you need to pay attention to it because all of these causes that we're going to be talking about today, they're also the causes of of diseases of longevity. So Mm -hmm. heart attacks, heart disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, cancer, autoimmunity, all of those things are also caused by these toxicities and these deficiencies. So it's time to like pay attention when the body is, is saying, hey, I'm too tired to do this, that, and the other thing. If you find that you don't have enough energy for what you want to do in life, 
then there's a problem and it is fixable. I just had somebody the other day who's 68 who says he feels better now than he did when he was 30. So, oh. so it, it's definitely possible and people just have to make the choice on prioritizing themselves and their health. That's so interesting. And I hear, I can actually, I could hear the optimism in your voice. You know, you're, you're kind of delivering a line that says, if you don't have the energy to do the things you want to do in life and you're getting enough sleep, that's a problem. Like that, that could be a really, you know, melodramatic line and a really, <laughs> really sad line, but, but I can hear in your voice that you're like, but it's fixable that I, I knew that was coming. And I think that's so amazing. Um, I, I do think recently, you know, we've seen a lot of people going into chronic fatigue as part of the long haulers. Right. And I, and I do want to pull that in just because I think it's so fascinating and so misunderstood. So how do we, how do we connect like the long haulers? How do people know if that's something that they should be looking into? Yeah. And so for people who don't know, long haulers are, are basically persistent symptoms from the pandemic virus. We're not going to say the name because of censorship issues, but when you get the virus and it persists, then this is what's being described now as long haulers. Um, and so the way that you know you have it is really based off of the chronology. So if you are a different person now, or if you have new symptoms since you got the virus, that means that it's highly likely that you that these symptoms are persisting. Now, there are up to 250 different symptoms that can be caused by the virus. It can be anything from fatigue, brain fog, body pain, shortness of breath, the loss of taste and smell, um, pain on the bottom of the feet, sleep issues, anxiety, depression. Like there's a tremendous amount. There was a study that was done recently where they looked at 265,000 people who had the virus. Six months later, 30% of them, so almost a third of them, had a new mental health diagnosis. So a new diagnosis of anxiety or depression. It's crazy. I mean, what's, what's going to end up happening here with all these new diagnoses, where if people aren't looking at this as a potential cause, they're going to be missing the boat. And yes, you can try to manage symptoms with medications and whatnot, but if you really want to get to the root so that you're not dependent on medications, which may or may not work for the rest of your life, it's really important to make sure that you're including this as part of your differential diagnosis, as part of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And what makes it, what makes it so hard to treat, you know, this chronic fatigue and the long haulers? So it really has to do with the fact that people aren't recognizing that the virus is persisting. Mm. So the thinking is that, you know, within a month, you should be able to get rid of the virus. And so now what are these symptoms actually from? Maybe they're from particles that are kind of left over or whatever. But there was one study that was done that looked at intestinal biopsies of people who had the virus four months and they got rid of it. They got had the virus, got rid of it. And then four months later, they don't have any symptoms. And half of these people on intestinal biopsy had live active virus in their intestines. So with these long haulers, the study hasn't been done yet, but you can guess that 100% of those people have live active virus. And so a lot of what's being prescribed, unfortunately, with some of these post clinics that are popping up, um, are, are still more symptom-based. So if somebody has shortness of breath, they go and see the cardiologist. If they have heart palpitations, they go and see the cardiologist. If they have chronic diarrhea now, they go and see the GI doc. But the reality is that they're all being caused by this virus that is persisting, plus all these other toxicities that we've been talking about. And so that's kind of like, why is why are some people getting the these persistent symptoms, this long haulers, and other people aren't? And a lot of it has to do with what are the other causes that you're bringing to the table? What sort of exposures to heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, allergies, negative emotional patterns do you already have where all of a sudden the virus is the straw that broke the camel's back? Mm. I just as an, you know, observation, not as an expert or professional in any way, I feel like this virus tends to exploit people's weaknesses. You know, if they have somewhat of a weak stomach, the virus is going to, you know, attack there or, or if they have weak adrenals or they're, you're, they're stressed out, 
Um, and maybe, I don't know if I'm right or wrong about that. I've noticed that a lot of people who are um, probably in adrenal fatigue, they're really, they're the type A, they're the hard workers, they're the CrossFitters, the marathon runners, the PhD students who are burning the candle, candle at both ends. I feel like they're more likely to experience the long haulers. Am, am I missing the mark on that? Or are those some of maybe the popular co-symptoms? Yeah, you're correct. And the reason why is that the more stressed out your body is, from either mental, emotional, or physical issues like these toxins that we're talking about, mm -hmm. the more dysfunctional your adrenals and your thyroid and your hormones are going to be. And so consequently, you're already on a precipice, you're already on a tipping point, and then all you need is that straw, you know, that then all of a sudden upends everything and the infection, that infection and then other infections can become more opportunistic mm -hmm. because the immune system is dysfunctional because it needs to be, in order for the immune system to be functional, it has to be managed correctly by the adrenals, by hormones, by vitamins and nutrients, et cetera. Yeah, if you, if you were to look at you know, a group of people who had never had the virus and got to see their medical history, do you think you would be able to predict who would struggle with long haulers or not? I do at this point, but I'd, in terms of looking at their medical history, I'd have to look at some labs because there are some of these. So of these 33 different causes, what's really cool is that 75% of these causes can be determined by symptoms alone. Okay. So those causes, I would be able to tell looking at their medical history, as long as the right questions were asked. Mm -hmm. The other 25%, like for heavy metals, for chemicals, for molds, mm -hmm. and then for, and then a stool test to determine whether there's infections in the body are going to be really the best tests that we need. So if I'm looking at the medical history and they have all that information, yes, I totally think that I would be able to discern it based off of what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've had a lot of experience with this. Uh, what are you seeing as far as success rate? Do you like turning people around? How often how, how does that happen? How well does it work? How do you know if someone's able to turn around? So it really depends on, well, I believe that everybody's able to turn it around. You know, it's just a matter of how many different causes do they have, okay. you know, because it's the, the length of time that it takes is really dependent on the number of causes that they have, because it's never just the virus, right? Like we mentioned, it's the number of causes that they have and the severity of those causes. So if somebody got bit by a tick when they were younger, they've got Lyme, and then all of a sudden they get this virus, or they get the virus on top of mold that's in the body, then, you know, it triggers a whole bunch of stuff. And then it's going to, um, you know, depending on how many, how severe that is, and how many of those causes determines how long it's going to take. Now, it also depends on how long they've been sick. The longer that they've been sick, the harder it is to treat. And this goes also for chronic fatigue. So the main difference between chronic fatigue and long haulers is just the bug. Because chronic fatigue has a number of different infections that can cause it from different viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, where can, cytomegalovirus, HHV6, there can be parasites, there can be bacteria, there can be Lyme, like Borrelia, Bartonella, uh, Babesia, Anaplasma. So a number of different um, infections that are present. And so the difference is just that um, the long haulers folks have all that stuff plus the, uh, the pandemic virus. And so that's kind of the difference there. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, yeah, it depends the severity and the complexity of the causes. And then, I mean, I'm sure we could throw in and how hard they're willing to work. <laughs> That's definitely true too. Cause yeah, it's not easy and you do have to be organized and you have to be committed to this process and you need to take a supplement for pretty much every cause that you have. And you need to um, learn about what the process, what, what it takes in order to remove a virus like this from the body where it's, you know, you can't just kill it and then it goes away. You go to kill it and it releases its toxins into the body and it causes something called die off or a Herxheimer reaction. And you have to mitigate that on your way. So there are bumps to the process, but as long as you have somebody who knows what they're doing and they're holding your hand through the process and you continue to take one step forward every single day, you're going to be successful. I have no doubt. I was just thinking that you need someone with you. This is not a, not a DIY thing. So right. you have a four-step process and correct me if I'm wrong, but is it, is it the same process you use for chronic fatigue and long haul? 
It's a little bit different, but okay. yeah, mainly it is. Yeah. So this is the energy MD method that I developed. And so the first step is to assess all the causes that you have. So hopefully big takeaway from this talk, if you haven't figured it out yet, you got to know your causes because, you know, if let's say you're going to try to drive, drive cross country, but you're not going to use Google maps or back in the day, AAA tick trip ticks or whatever. Right. So if you don't have a map, you're not going to be able to get there. So consequently people who are saying, well, I'm going to try this therapy and I'm going to try this therapy and they don't even know what causes they have, you're not going to be as successful because the causes that you, Joe Schmo over here has, you might have causes two, four, six, eight, and 10, and Sally Sue might have causes one, three, five, seven, and nine. So consequently, their treatments are going to be different. Even though their symptoms look the same. Like, I think we do that a lot. We read about someone online and like, oh, I feel like that person felt, what did they do? They did X, therefore I'll try X. Right. But that totally makes sense. Like that's not data driven. Right. Yeah. Okay. Step two is, let's keep going. Well, and, and in terms of those assessing those causes, like I said, 75% of these causes can be determined by symptoms alone, which is really great because you don't have to spend an arm and a leg on, on labs. And then you can spend your money on the labs that you really need, which is those 25% that I mentioned before. So that's step one. So then step two, when we come back to this deficiencies and toxicities thing, if you remember, I said that this process was really all about the toxins, all about the heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, et cetera. But the reality is, is that we want people to feel better as fast as possible. And we want them to be able to deal with the stress of removing the toxins later. So we actually replace deficiencies first. And the first thing that we do is we replace what I call the big three. So this is adrenals, which is a little triangular gland that sits on top of the kidneys. It produces cortisol and other stress hormones. And it gives us our get up and go in the morning. It helps out with our circadian rhythm so that our body knows what awake is and what sleep looks like or when we're supposed to go to sleep and when we're supposed to wake up. So that's the adrenals. The other one is the mitochondria, which produces 80 to 90% of all of our energy and is found in every single cell in the body except for red blood cells. And then we also replace the thyroid. So if you have low thyroid symptoms, this by replacing adrenals and mitochondria, that helps to boost the thyroid. And then if you need some additional thyroid support, we have a, a process for doing that. And I operate in the online environment as a health coach. So everything that we do is natural. And I do that because I found that when you use strong natural things, you don't need prescriptions anymore. Plus also it allows me to work with people across the nation as well as internationally. So that's the beginning of step two is replacing the big three. And then we go into the vitamins and minerals. And we don't even get to the lifestyle habits, like changing what you're eating or sleeping or water or any of that stuff until the end of step two, because generally people are so tired that they don't even have the energy or the want or the will to be able to make those changes. So we give them the energy first with the big three, and then we can go into step three. Any questions on that before I go to step three? Well, it's just, it's just so practical. Right? <laughs> like if you don't have the energy to figure out a new diet, that's going to fail. So even right. if that might be best practice from like a strict health perspective, you're working with human beings. So I right. just kind of love it. <laughs> yeah. And diet is really interesting too, because there's a lot of people out there who are like, I've tried every single diet and it doesn't make a difference. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, just as an aside, when we think about these 20 plus causes is that we see them as like 20 nails in the bottom of the foot. And let's say that the, but all the nails are not, do not count equally. Mm -hmm. The biggest nails and uh, with the most dysfunction are usually like mold and, uh, and uh, an infection or two, okay. mm -hmm. usually infections are multiples. And so if you pull one of those out, that's going to make a bigger difference than if you pull out the gluten nail. Now, I believe everybody needs to be gluten-free and dairy-free and as sugar-free as possible. But the reality is, is that if you're not feeling well, that may not happen. And so let's actually go after the biggest bang for the buck, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the approach that, that I take. It's, I mean, it's great. It totally makes sense. So then, then what? what is step three now, diet or not? No, but we're going to do diet at the end of step two. 
So we okay. will talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about, and I do recommend a paleo diet that works well for most people. Some people, a ketogenic diet would be better, but basically we're looking at meat and vegetables, low to no grains, no gluten, no dairy, and low sugar. And then, you know, more water, more good food, like we were talking about, more sleep, making sure you are getting seven to nine hours a night. If you do like biometrics, it's very interesting to get an aura ring or a Garmin or a Whoop or one of these things to actually see what your sleep is doing. That's kind of pretty cool because um, it may change the way that you're doing certain things in your life and you may see how important your sleep is. You know, most people actually have to go to bed before 10. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, I go to bed at 1030 every night and I sleep pretty well. Like, See what would happen if you went to bed before 10. Sometimes amazing things happen um, when, when that happens. So, and then movement, you know, if people are too tired, then they're not gonna be able to engage in any movement, but movement really is a panacea. So it's good for everything. So even if you can only do like five jumping jacks a day because you're too tired, try to do five jumping jacks a day. Okay, but if you feel worse after you're exercising, it's too much. And this is actually part of one of the reasons why long haulers folks are lower are, are younger than 50 and most of them are athletic and i hear a lot of stories about i was training for a marathon and then this happened and a lot of that is because they went back to training too soon and they went back to exercise too soon they thought they had gotten rid of the virus but they were just kind of teetering on the edge and the exercise was too stressful for them and then all of a sudden down the tubes went the adrenals and the thyroid and the mitochondria and all that sort of stuff so you have to listen to your body and make sure you're not pushing things like we do so often in our society, especially with things like work and exercise. We have to listen to our body and, and pay attention. That, but that's the end of step two. Step two, you're, you're kind of cheating. That was like 10 steps. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is true, but it, you know, it helps to simplify it a little bit. It does. No, no, no. I mean, you are the MD. I will let you, I'll let you continue. But if a mathematician looked at that, I don't know if it would count as one step. What? <laughs> so it is, it is fixing a lot of things, but I do, I do like that you have a process starting with giving some energy and then using that energy to do good things for the body. I feel like everyone should be better by now, but there's two more steps. Dr. Hirsch, what's next? They are. There are two more steps. And I should say, in my defense, when I say the 33 different causes, that includes all of them. So okay. the four steps just incorporates the 33. So, Got it. okay. So then step three, we're going to open up the detoxification pathway. So what this means is that in order to get the toxins out of the body, we actually have to, we have these detoxification pathways. Now detox is kind of like a catch word, but you have these processes in the human body that end up binding to certain things in order to be able to eliminate them out of the body. So we generally eliminate things out of our body through our, our poop, our pee, our breath, and our skin, right? So we try to use these different pathways in supporting the intestines, the liver, the kidney, the lymph, which is the garbage system of the body, and the neurolymph, which is the garbage system in the brain. Now, the more toxins that you have, the more clogged these pathways are. So I think about them as like these tubes, these hollow tubes that are in your body, where if you grab a toxin out of the tissues, out of the organs, out of things outside the blood vessels, and you pull it in, if the tubes are clogged, guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna go right back into that same compartment or it's gonna go into a different compartment, but it ain't gonna come out. So the first thing we have to do is we have to open up these pathways. We have to clean them out. We have to get in there with a rotor rooter, right? We have to blow into these tubes, whatever we need to do to open them up. I'm being silly, but like we're using herbs and we're using a number of other things that we do in order to open up those pathways. And then, and one of the ways I like to look at this too is kind of like a funnel because then when we start to grab these toxins in step four and start to remove them, the bottom of this funnel is step three, is how open are these pathways? If, these path, if, this, if the path detox pathways are clogged, guess what? You put a toxin in here, it's gonna come right back out, right? But if they're open, you put the toxin in and then it can be eliminated. 
So once again, this process is all about step four, but we have to set the stage in order to be successful. A lot of people who have long haulers or have lime or have mold and have tried to remove them before and don't feel good, it's because they didn't spend enough time in step three. And they're just, they're trying to grab these things and pulling them out of the body. And they're just going back into a different compartment or they're feeling worse or whatever, because these pathways aren't open. Yeah, if there's not an exit pathway, what are you going to do? You can't be just kicking the toxins around. And so then that's, you kind of previewed step four, which is, is it, it's killing the virus in the case of long haul or eliminating toxins in the case of chronic fatigue? It's, it's removing all of them. Okay. So there's a toxic matrix that ends up happening. So heavy metals, chemicals, molds, um, infections, they all kind of like to play with each other and hang out with each other and feed on each other. And so essentially they form like these toxic matrices in the body. And so when you start to pull something out of here, all of a sudden the other, it opens up and then the other ones start to be removed as well. And so what we like to do is we want to make sure that you have things on board to kind of bind up any of these stray I don't know what we're going to call them, these stray bad guys who are kind of coming out so you can bind them up and then get them out of the body. So yes, we're using herbs in order to um, kill off some of these infections. We start off with the infections that are causing the symptoms. So a lot of these infections can actually be determined by symptoms alone. And we can definitely go into what some of these symptoms are so that people can self-identify. But that once you know who's like your biggest problem child, then you can, how oh, I say this on a parenting show, the biggest problem child, then you can go ahead and you can focus on those things. And then you can remove them in an order that your body is telling you, you need to, you need to use. Well, you, you kind of opened a curiosity loop for me when you said we can go into some of the symptoms. How can we not <laughs> teach, <laughs> teach us more? <laughs> So into, we talked about some of the symptoms of the long haulers and so in the chronology. And so if you know, and I should clarify too, so that if you know that you got the pandemic virus and then you've got these symptoms and then they persisted, you should be able to trace that back and be like, okay, this is a major cause. For some people, they got the virus, they had symptoms, it went away. And then a month or two later, all of a sudden they got these weird symptoms. Well, that is also from the pandemic virus. Unless right. And even asymptomatic folks with the virus have then had long haulers. Exactly. Correct, right? Yeah. Correct. But they have to, they have to have some symptoms in order to end up with long haulers. So they're, as, they're asymptomatic. Yeah. They might be asymptomatic initially for a couple of months and then something pops up. Right. You know, all of a sudden they got heart palpitations or they got pain in the bottom of the feet or they got nerve pain or they have muscle cramps at night or they're all of a sudden spontaneously sweating or their sleep is messed up, right? So any of these new symptoms that have happened after you, like since November, 2019, essentially, and you had the virus, because you may not even know, I think that's what you were saying with, with asymptomatic, like you may not even have known. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah, so if you didn't even know that you had the virus because you didn't really have any symptoms and then all of a sudden you've got these weird symptoms, you have to include that as well. And one of the ways that you'll know is if you start going after it by using antivirals, whether they're prescription, whether they're herbal, and you start noticing that either you feel worse or you feel better, then you know you're on the right track because you're killing off that thing that's a problem. Okay. So if the antivirals do something, right. the target is the right target, but maybe not at the right time of your healing journey. Yes, that's, that's definitely part of it as well. And the prescription antivirals aren't as good as the herbals. And the reason why is because the prescriptions, oftentimes what they're doing is they're decreasing the replication. So they're not getting rid of the amount of virus that's present. They're just decreasing, they're just preventing it from um, getting more, from extrapolating, like from going control? to different places. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> Can I, I make that joke? <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, I guess so. And so, um, and so with the herbs, you're actually getting down into killing the virus, um, which is definitely different than halting its replication. The other thing that's interesting that we're seeing with long haulers is that people, sometimes they're, these persistent symptoms are from the virus itself. And sometimes these symptoms are actually from other infections where the virus is acting as a biofilm disruptor. 
So biofilm is kind of like this collagenous jelly-like material that exists on our mucous membranes in the body where bugs hide. And oftentimes they're swapping DNA with each other and making super bugs. But what we're seeing is that the, the pandemic virus is kind of breaking up this biofilm, the bugs are popping out, and then they are causing much of the symptoms that we're seeing. And this biofilm oftentimes is produced by the bugs, produced by the body to kind of keep the bugs in check. And so if you break up the biofilm at the wrong time, then all of a sudden you can, you can start to get some of these symptoms. So if we take a look, and all these symptoms that I'm going to mention right now for some of these infections can also be caused by the pandemic virus. And so you just have to realize that, yes, maybe you have this infection, or it could just be that you have long haulers. So for example, if we take a look at one infection called Bartonella, where upwards of 50% of all domestic animals actually carry this bacteria in their bodies. And so if you've been licked by your dog or your cat, um, or they've scratched you or bitten you or anything like that, it's highly likely that you have it. And then if you start to express symptoms of pain in the feet, sometimes on the bottom of the feet, sometimes it's burning of the feet. Sometimes it's just tender where when you get out of bed, you're like, oh, I really wish that I had slippers and you want to wear slippers throughout the day. Sometimes you have muscle cramps, usually in the calves, usually at night. Oftentimes your sleep is going to be worse where you're going to have problems falling asleep or staying asleep. And then you might have anxiety, might have some depression, might have some thyroid issues or th some thyroid symptoms. You might have Bartonella striae, which is like a stretch mark where it looks like you've been scratched um, or like you had some weight changes, but you're like, yeah, my weight didn't change over time. You may have cold hands and cold feet because the Bartonella causes the blood vessels to spasm. So any of these symptoms, if you had like three of these, you could have Bartonella or it could be long haulers. Mm -hmm. I do have a Bartonella quiz on my website if anybody wants to go check it out and see if they have Bartonella. Um, and then another one is like Babesia, which is considered the North American malaria. And so for these people, they have spontaneous sweating that usually comes in cycles. Sometimes it's every day, every other day, once a week, once a month. Sometimes it's during the day, sometimes it's at night. They're usually the hottest person in the room. So these are different than hot flashes. Mm -hmm. So the best way to determine whether or not, you know, if you never had hot flashes, then you know that it's not hot flashes. But hot flashes usually is kind of more gradual. And these are kind of like more spontaneous sweating. But you're usually the hottest person in the room. And oftentimes you're saying, hey, can we turn up the AC? And people are like, what are you kidding me? Or you live in a cold environment and you're the one outside shoveling snow in your short sleeves, right? And you're like, oh yeah, this feels great. So you can also have shortness of breath with Babesia. And then sleep is usually awful. So much worse than Bartonella where really hard time falling asleep and staying asleep. And then mood is usually pretty awful. Anxiety to the point of panic attacks. And this was really unfortunate when this happened to my wife a couple of years ago. Um, and part of it was kind of triggered by long haulers or by the pandemic virus. And then oftentimes people will have depression to the point of suicidal thoughts. Mm. So you don't have to have all those symptoms, but just having a couple of them would make you think, oh, maybe I have Babesia. Okay. And so those are kind of some of the big ones. And then with Lyme, just the last one real quick, is Borrelia and you really can't have, a lot of people are like, do I have Lyme or not? You really can't have Lyme unless you have two symptoms. You have to have symptoms that come and go where some days are much worse than other days so that you can't, you don't feel like you want to schedule uh, uh, any sort of appointment because you don't know how you're going to feel on that day. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that symptoms have to move around the body. So whether it's joint pain, muscle pain, or nerve pain or nerve symptoms, they maybe this week they're in the shoulder and then next week they're or next month they're in the knee or something like that, but they move around the body. There's very few things that do that. And the reason why I'm talking about these symptoms in this way is because all labs are imperfect. It's just a given. And especially when it comes to these infections, most of these labs are looking at the immune system's reaction to these infections. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens? If you've got heavy metals, chemicals, molds, and infections, guess where the immune system is? It's off in left field, and you're not going to get an accurate test looking wow. at the immune system's reaction to something. I tell you, no wonder Lyme is called the mystery disease because doctors must think patients are a little crazy, and people mm. probably feel that way too. Like, oh, doc, my 
pain's always moving. But I mean, that's literally the symptom of life. That's that's like so good to know. Like everyone just needs to like tuck that in that folder in their brain. Like I might need this someday, you know? Um, goodness, goodness. So there's a lot of pieces that play into chronic fatigue. Is there any way for us to know that like we are headed down that hill or that we're walking toward that precipice you mentioned before we are laying on the couch and unable to do dishes? Are there levels to this? Um, there are. Um, I can I see it more as like a spectrum, okay. you know, where I try to get people to just be aware. But in terms of like the, when I do look at levels, oftentimes it's when I'm looking at what ends up healing things or what ends up um, healing the issue. So if we're looking at lifestyle habits, so if somebody needs more good food, more water, more sleep, more movement, and they get those things and their fatigue goes away, I call that like a level one problem. Okay. Okay. If they do all those things and they're still tired and then they go to replacing the deficiencies and they replace all their deficiencies and a lot of naturopaths and integrative docs and functional medicine docs are really good at this stage so they can really help and so if that takes care of the issue then that's like a level two problem Mm -hmm. where somebody like me comes in because a lot of integrative functional and natural docs won't touch a lot of these environmental stuff so if you're still tired, then you need to go after the heavy metals and the chemicals and the molds and the infections and the allergies and the negative emotional patterns and the electromagnetic fields. And so that's why in our programs, we have a trauma coach on staff for the emotional health. We focus a lot on mindset. And then we're doing a lot of the physical stuff. We've got a health coach and we've got a a nutrition coach in addition to me. Um, and, and I mentioned a mindset coach in order to be able to deal with all this mind, body, um, and emotions that need to go into this, this whole process. And that's kind of where it gets more complicated and where you need to make sure that the practitioner that you're working with actually has knowledge and success in each of these areas. Cause I remember when I was, you know, practicing fun- just functional medicine and I was like, yeah, I was, I was into heavy metals but I didn't know much about molds, didn't know much about infections, didn't really want to know much. I was like, oh, I'll leave that to other people. But it was required because I was started getting the sick of the sick and I just couldn't tolerate not being able to help people. So I had to learn those things and then had to incorporate them to make sure there's no stone left unturned. Because we know if we we address every single potential cause that that somebody has, we're a lot more likely to be successful. It makes sense. And I think we can pull a thread too back from toward the beginning of the interview when you said if someone's having heart palpitations, they're sent to the cardiologist. And if they're having diarrhea, they're sent to the GI doc. So like conventional allopathic medicine is very compartmentalized. Okay. And it doesn't really make sense unless you have a broken foot. Right. <laughs> right. As you said. And so when we're experiencing these symptoms that are mind, body connected. We, yeah, we need to, we need to hit it all. And I do think that's a huge paradigm shift, especially for people who have only experienced conventional medicine. So it's, it's something to, to sit there for a minute, I'm just kind of giving the audience a second to ponder that how important it is to be integrated, how important it is to find someone who can do integrative health. I mean, that's, it's right there in the name. Um, as we're, as we're getting toward the close here, I'm curious because, you know, this is the healthy parenting connector. So we're talking to parents and a lot of times, I mean, we would sure like to think that all these chronic diseases are just for the adults. We know that chronic diseases are vastly increasing, sadly, in our kids, but, but I think even more so, a lot of us really want prevention, right? Like, are there habits that we can set up for our kids in their lifestyle to prevent some of the chronic fatigue that we're seeing, you know, in the adults of our generation? Absolutely. Yeah. Our kids are actually supposed to be the first generation that doesn't outlive their parents. No, isn't that horrible? It's really horrible. We got to figure something out. Yeah. And that's why your work is so important. Um, And really going back to basics with these kids as much as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more mental health in kids than ever. You know, I just had a conversation with a, a, a middle school math teacher last night, and she was telling me about how you know, these kids are sicker than ever. And so much of it has to do with a lot of these insults that we have, whether they're mind, 
body or emotional, right? They're being put in, in positions that we never were as kids and that would are really challenging. And so trying to get back to basics and like, what would life look like? This is always a good barometer. What would life look like if your kid was growing up in like the 80s? right? What sort of access to screens would they have, right? It's probably watching, you know, leave it to beaver in the evening. I mean, I'm not that old, but you know, like it's, I think that's black and white, right? Um, but it's like, you know, watching something with the family in the evening, like what kind of access versus what kind of access to screens do they have now? You know, social media, you want to be in constant comparison. Con comparison is the thief of happiness. You want to make your kids unhappy, give them social media. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's just kind of a rule like in, in our house, except for YouTube, which I monitor, like there's no social media. Right. So there's so, some of these things that you can kind of, you know, and you have to step into it lightly, depending on how old the kid is and whatever the the earlier you start, the better. But the better that you can come back to all natural food, natural cooking, you know, lots of water, lots of movement. What kind of exercise are they getting? Are they getting outside every day? What kind of fun are they having? Is fun like, like kids are supposed to be having fun, right? So yes, we want them to go to school and we want them to be successful, but we have to make, make sure that fun is a priority for them. Now, fun is a top value for me. It may not be for that individual kid, but I do think that there is a period of development where all kids really want to have fun and they want to be outside and they want to be running around with their friends, right? So we have to make sure that we're fostering that and allow them to be kids for as long as possible. And so that's, you know, I never really wanted to get into mindset and emotional stuff, but I personally, as well as professionally, but I realized once I jumped into it personally, that it transformed my life. And then I wanted to bring it to everybody that I knew. And the same thing goes, you know, my, my daughter's 13 and I'm like, Hey, you're, you're ready to do your mindset stuff. And she says, no, I don't want to do the mindset stuff. I say, okay when do you want to do it? Or do you realize that it's important? She's like, yes, I realize that it's important, but I'm 13. And I'm like, yes, I, I understand that. You realize that the sooner that you do this, the more you're going to be able to achieve everything that you want in your life. She's like, that's not important to me right now. So you have to figure out, you know, where your kid's at. And she says she's going to do it at some point. And so, you know, maybe it'll be when she's kind of stuck or whatever, you know, and so you have to wait for that door to open. But there's, these are life skills that we really have to be teaching our kids so they're going to be successful. I really wish that I learned mindset when I was growing up. You know, like I know that it would have made my journey so much easier instead of me getting caught in suffering time and time again. So um, I just kind of went on a tirade, but that, that is, that's kind of like one of the things that I want to leave people with today is that mindset, you know, we're talking a lot about like mind, body, emotional stuff, like mindset and emotional health are like the most important things. Um, yeah, body's important too, but I think those are the most important things that people have to pay attention to. Wow. This, I mean, first of all, you just sort of built a recipe for a healthy childhood. And what I love is that the ingredients were so simple, so freaking simple, kick them outside, feed them real food, take away the screens, ta -da! like <laughs> make sure they get sleep. Like this is not rocket science, you know? And this is basically a family doctor <laughs> telling us like, you don't need the expensive things right? You don't need the difficult habits. Now I am a little bit curious. You said, you say to your daughter, are you going to do your mindset work in like 60 seconds? What does that look like? Like, is that a conversation? Is this meditation? And so, work? yeah. So the mindset practice that we teach that I've learned is four parts. And so the first step is gratitudes. So um, there's a lot of research on each one of these components. I'll just do them quick. So gratitudes, being grateful for where you are and what's going on in your life, envisioning your ideal day. So what does your ideal day look like five years, 10 years from now? You're waking up. Where are you? What does your day look like? Um, the next step is to look at any sort of limiting beliefs that you have and flipping them into empowering beliefs. If you feel like there's not enough time, not enough money, then telling yourself time and time again, 
everything's always working out for me because we have to reprogram the brain. And then the last one is uh, most people are asking themselves a disempowering question, like, why is this happening to me? Why is this so hard? And you, and if you ask yourself those questions, guess what? You're going to get an answer that you're not going to like. So you have to ask yourself empowering questions. Like, what can I do to love myself even more today? What can I do to move my health forward even more today? What can I do to connect with my kid and support my kid even more today? Right. So you ask yourself a better question, you're actually going to get better answers, and then you're going to be able to live uh, a, uh, a better life, uh, live more fully. So that's kind of the mindset work. But there's some certain things that we'll do. Like I really like the um, gosh, what's his name? Um, the seven principles. Oh, Stephen Covey. No, it's not Stephen oh, Covey. Okay. It's the uh, chicken soup for the soul guy. Oh, Mark Victor Hansen. No, the other one. Jack Canfield. Jack Canfield. I feel like yes. I'm in jeopardy. I'm asking yes. <laughs> well done. Yeah. So Jack Canfield wrote a book called The Success Principles, and he's got a teen version as well. And so we were listening to it, just the audio book. And then because uh, I listened to the adult version and I really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And so it just kind of talks about just really good principles to be able to mindset principles for success in life. Man, so fascinating. So good. And I mean, did I hear this right? That you're saying that's one of the most important things we can do to prevent and pull ourselves out of chronic fatigue. I mean, obviously 33 of them, but you're putting mindset way up there. Mindset's way up there. Hmm. I'm totally fascinated. Now, Dr. Hirsch, at the end of the Healthy Parenting Connector, I always like to leave parents with something optimistic, a message of hope. So if you could encourage parents in one way today, what do you want them to remember? So I love to see the world have a gratitude practice mm -hmm. every day. And a lot of people pray, which is great, but maybe at dinner, maybe when you're having dinner and they've done your program and they're cooking their food, right? And that everybody goes around and expresses gratitude or you do it with your kid and you make you make them see that you're doing it and so you're modeling that behavior and then they're doing it themselves. But I think if kids can just have gratitude for where they are and where they're going, I think that it can transform the world. Amazing. And that can be part of, if you already have a prayer practice, just make sure that gratitude is part of it, correct? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Not just asking for things, but also being thankful for mm -hmm. things. Very cool. Well, I am very grateful, Dr. Evan Hirsch, for your time. I'm very grateful for what you do for the world and give to the world and that you serve the whole world that anyone can, can work with you through your four slash 33 steps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an English person, but I can count. No, I'm totally kidding. I mean, I thought you just, you explained everything so very well. Your analogies, your metaphors are on point. And I just know this is going to be one of these interviews that people come back to. So thank you very, very much. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Healthy Parenting Connector, parents, I know that you, like me, just want to raise healthy, independent kids. And it turns out the recipe has some pretty simple ingredients. So we're so grateful that you are here with us on the Healthy Parenting Connector. And I will see you back next week with another expert to give you some of the information you need to do that job of being an intentional parent.